So as uh, Professor Kusre said, I'm a graduate of 1980. Uh, about that time, many of you were just toddlers, not even born. Anyone born in 1980? No one born in 1980. Okay, uh, 1990. Everyone, right? Okay, good. So uh, I'm not going to give a lecture. Uh, students from previous batches and Professor Kusre will tell you that I like to have an interactive session. And most of what you will see here is not in textbooks. It's based on personal experience and experience of people that I've worked with. And so you will get as much out of it as you put into it. And as Professor Kustray said, this will be an important part of your assignment here. So today I'm going to talk about business models and revenue models here. Uh, how many of you know the word funda? Fundas. What, what, does the word, where, what is the origin of the word fundas? Fundamentals, yeah. So that's exactly right. So we use this term called uh, business model. We use it very frequently. But what happens is we don't quite understand what that term means. So what is a business model? Can someone tell me that? What is a business model? Oh, value creation, that's one part of it. That's very good. So a business model is what a company focuses on. What is the business of a business? What is the business of a company? What's the purpose of a company? It's three things. It's to create value. It's to figure out how to deliver the value. And the third thing is what? is to capture the value. Those are the three important purposes for any company. And the rationale is for an organization to create, deliver, and retain some of that value itself. And a business model is the tenet, it's the ground rules, it's the philosophy, it's the mechanisms whereby a company is able to create, deliver, and retain some of that value, okay? Very simple. Uh, I don't want any of you to get uh, stuck up on uh, specific definitions of models. There are as many models as there are people. There are multiple permutations and combinations of different things. I want you to understand and focus on the concepts here right now. So there are five important aspects on how a company creates, delivers, and retains value. It has to first decide what it's going to do. Unless it decides what it's going to do, it won't be able to do any of those things. It has to figure out how it's going to do it. It has to figure out how it's going to be different and unique from everyone else who is going to try and do similar things. And a company doesn't have unlimited resources, does it? No company on the planet has unlimited resources, so it has to focus on what is important and what is less important. And therefore, a company has to prioritize things or sequence and stage things. And then it has to have some economic logic on how it's going to make money. So while it's trying to create, deliver, and retain the value, it has to look at these five different elements on how it goes about doing it. You guys with me so far? Great. What I'm about to share with you today applies as much to virtual goods such as on the internet and things like that, as it is to real goods, as it, as it is to real services. Uh, uh, there was a, a maid service business that was founded by one of your, um, one of your peers. He graduated, uh, yeah, and he had a, one of the similar models here. So everything I'm saying applies to both virtual companies such as Facebook and Zynga, as it does to real companies that deliver hard products and hard goods such as IKEA. All right, so this is applicable to everything. Before we get on to the specifics of a business model, there have been certain massive major events that have happened over, since 1980 or so. And the pace of innovation and the pace of change really began in about the 1980s uh, when I'd just gone to the US. So can someone shoot out, shout out for me what are some 
major game changers that have been happened. Personal computers is one. Internet is one. A smartphone is one. Cloud computing is one. That's on the other side. This concept of open software is one, right? These are the fundamental things that have changed how people think, how people try and deliver value. Okay, these are the game changers. There is one other concept I want all of you to remember, and it's known as the long tail concept. Anyone know what a long tail concept is? Okay, this is very important in very successful business models. And a long tail uh, looks something like this. So when a product is first introduced, it is very, very, very popular, right? And so the demand for that product is high. Over time, the popularity and the interest in the product dwindles down, but successful business models and successful products are one where while the interest or the popularity of the product has dwindled, they still continue almost into perpetuity in a steady state way. So they continue generating revenues for the con uh, company in a perpetual way. So here's how I like to define what the long tail is. And the long tail is what has really enabled a lot of the business models that are popular today. Uh, so here's a complicated sentence. We'll try and parse it out. Selling more of something today that didn't sell at all yesterday than you sell today of all the things that did sell yesterday. All right, complicated. So I'm going to help you here. Replace the word something and the word things with the word books. Okay, that's what Amazon did. They sell more of books today that weren't even around yesterday, that weren't even sold yesterday. So piece of a book, imagine this is a book, wasn't even around yesterday. They sold more of it today than they sold of all the books that were available and that did sell yesterday. You guys follow now? So the long tail is, as a pop product becomes popular, you sell a lot of it, and it sells more of it, though it didn't exist yesterday. And this is what creates that long tail. Let me pause. Does any, everyone understand this concept of the long tail? Selling more of something today that didn't exist yesterday than you sold of everything today that did exist yesterday. Got it? Okay. Tongue twister, but uh, that's the concept. All right, so I'm going to get into numerous different uh, models here, business models. And I want some interaction from the group here. So we're going to start with a subscription model. What's a subscription model? Hmm? Oh, yeah, you're telling me where it originated. That, that was going to be my fourth question. So you're way ahead of me. That's a good thing. But what is it? What is a subscription model? No, it's not limited period of time. It's unlimited period of time. Yes. Sir. But it doesn't have to be only data. It could be actual goods or services. So a subscription model is a way to hook someone up where you pay on an ongoing basis, almost in perpetuity, right? So your phones, you pay monthly for it, right? It's a subscription. You're paying every month for usage of the data. Uh, you, we're going to take a, talk about a couple of case studies also. So a subscription model is where you pay on an ongoing basis rather than once. Yes, that's right. If you want, you can discontinue that. But once they've hooked you into it and you've got everything set up properly, are you likely to discontinue it? You're not likely to discontinue it, right? So they've got you hooked on and they say, yeah, you can cancel it anytime you want. Uh, it's for one month. You pay me 500 rupees for one month. And if you want, cancel it. 
but the probability of you canceling it is very low and so now you go on paying it forever all right so that's what a subscription plan is so why why does it work we talked about some of the reasons and why is it good for a company it provides the company a ongoing continuous revenue stream as some of you build your companies and grow them and look at trying to exit from the company as in sell the company to someone if you have a business model where every day you wake up and you have to go out and sell something all the time where without selling it your company doesn't get revenue let's say every day I have to go out and I have to sell uh, a projector every day right that's a very difficult way to earn a living it's known as the hunting right you don't eat unless you hunt whereas with a subscription model you've sold it once you've hooked on someone and the revenues keep on coming so when when you when you build your company and go to sell it one day the value investors place on your business when it has a subscription model is much higher than the value they place on a business that has one time revenues Do you understand why because that revenue stream is granted almost in, guaranteed almost into perpetuity whereas single sale revenues you have to go out and sell every day or every year whatever it is all right so it it, uh, it it has a lock-in mechanism like we talked about the Vodafone, Vodafone and and the revenue stream over time is much greater than the one-time price of the product any questions I understand that okay good uh, what are some examples before we go to examples I think this gentleman here what's your name huh Urshish so Urshish talked about newspapers and magazines you didn't get a copy of my presentation before did you because uh, because that's what I have here it was pioneered by newspapers and magazines so yeah th these are the people who really originated it and when newspapers and magazines were out there selling it we didn't have fancy names for it did we I mean it was like okay yeah, it's a monthly uh, for your newspaper so it was pioneered by newspapers and magazines and the people uh, who are currently using these subscription models there are numerous of them but some well-known names uh, Netflix Kindle etc all right any questions here so I'm going to come to that they have two sources of revenue uh, advertising is one source and that's another model which I'm going to talk about later uh, it's the marketplace model uh, you guys are way ahead of me here uh, but they also charge you every month to subscribe to the newspaper right that's their subscription fee so I don't know what a Times of India subscription costs nowadays but it's something every month you pay that okay that's the part I'm referring to here Right, so uh, Professor Kusre makes a good point. Uh, you guys all know about the Bloomberg terminal, right? You, you uh, in the U.S. it costs about three thousand dollars or so, and once you get hooked on to it, you have to keep on paying that every month because you're dependent on it, and that's a subscription. It's not a one-time fee on it. Okay, so I want to talk about another business model called the freemium business model do you guys know what a freemium business model is yes shout out someone what is it yeah very well put uh, that's a very simple way of putting uh, putting it so what you do is you give away a portion of your service and that portion of the service isn't all inclusive there are other portions that you value like um, I started with Pandora the music thing and when I started with Pandora I used to love the love the uh, stations I set up my own radio stations there there were very few advertisements on it 
and uh, I enjoyed it and now slowly they have started introducing advertisements that are almost every uh, you know after every song and it is pretty aggravating and they say well if you do not want those upgrade to the premium part. So, you give away a portion, you get someone hooked on and then you add on other things. So, it is a business model where they have free access to something, but then additional features cost. Now, why is this important? Why is you said that is what they do, why is it important for a company to have a freemium model? Well, it works when the marginal cost of producing a incremental product or getting an incremental customer is close to 0. If you already have your service and the marginal cost of getting the second or the third customer is close to 0, I can afford to give a limited feature set away to the customers, initial customers at a for free and then as I add more feature functions, I can get more customers on. Now, the important thing is that so while you have your free customers, you are still getting a significant benefit and that benefit is you are building a community, you are getting the data and the feedback from all those free customers that you can now use to create better products and services later on. So, it is not it is not as if you are not getting anything back, you are starting it and you are hearing a lot back, you are improving your service, you are upgrading it and now you are charging more for it. All right, what are some examples of freemium? Hmm? Gaming apps, yeah. Huh? Hot, yeah, that is right, hot star, what else? Yeah, website Google is a good example, Google, Google is not a slightly different one, but it was pioneered by software companies before you were born. Okay, in the 1980s if you read up some literature there were companies like AOL and CompuServe and others that started sending you software diskettes in the mail and they were free and they had very limited functionality and you would stick the floppy disk in your computer and you would use the software and you say oh, but for this other feature you need to buy something else and so it really started off back in the 80s and um, Dropbox is a great example, a LinkedIn, New York Times allows you to read only a certain number of pages for free, so there is a lot of different examples that you guys are familiar with. So, a freemium service and the reason I talk a lot about freemium is a lot of companies are trying to do that, you know, capture a lot of customers quickly and then start charging them and monetizing the customer base. Uh, the free portion of it can be restricted in multiple different ways. One way to restrict it is uh, Skype for example, free Skype gives you only one to one two way conference calling. Skype for business which is a premium part of it allows you to have conferencing across multiple uh, users. You can restrict it based on a capacity, Dropbox is a great example, I forget what the free portion is, a couple of megabytes or a couple of gigabytes probably, yeah a couple of gigabytes and you run out of a couple of gigabytes the minute you take you know a few hundred pictures you are done with it, right. So, you need to upgrade to a premium portion of it. Uh, Autodesk came up uh, with a great way where uh, uh, the software package is free to students. Now, think about it, as a student you are using AutoCAD and you have gotten used to it and you enjoy it and you go work in an engineering company, you are going to recommend that they use AutoCAD and now you have to buy it, right. So, they have got you hooked on and as you want more features or as you develop professionally, you are going to go for the uh, other version. Uh, Farmville is a game, uh, someone talked about games, you know you can unlock games uh, levels quicker with the premium version. I talked about Pandora, ad free you can get uh, enjoy the uh, service, tiered we talked about LinkedIn, there is LinkedIn free, all of you are probably on LinkedIn, 
but there is a LinkedIn premium, right? You go to higher level. Um, soft paywalls, that was the New York Times example. A few, you can read about 20 or so articles free, but if you want to read the whole thing or the complete article, then you got to subscribe. So these are all examples of the freemium uh, part. You guys know about all these examples. So a couple of important things to understand about freemium. Uh, while the cost, there's no upfront price, there is a fee for every upgrade. All right, you have to have that discipline to make sure that you don't keep expanding what you're delivering in the free part. Otherwise, you'll never make money. You'll never be able to capture money. So it's free and it's not premium. It's not high price. So it's one important attribute of a freemium service. Um, freemium is not the same as a free trial. A free trial, you give someone, try it. If you want something, you buy it, right? Freemium is free forever, but the limited functionality. So don't confuse freemium with free trial. A freemium, the objective is to get to the premium part where people are paying you for it. So your objective is to convert a certain number of your free customers over to your premium service or to your paying customers. You guys with me following so far? Okay. All right, there's another model called the free model. And it's just what it sounds, it's free. And um, the, the key part of this free model is that the user is not the final intended paying customer. All right, so I might give it to you free, but I'm getting a benefit in terms of a payment from someone else. But what I'm also getting is the data and the attention of that person. That's right. Yeah, you or something you're providing the company is being sold off to someone else. So the, the reason this is a important business model is it's very easy to gain a lot of users, right, very quickly. It's free, no one worries about it, you get a lot of customers. And now you have, as Professor Kusre said, uh, data on you and you effectively are being sold off um, and the end user is not the customer of the free model company. Yes, sir. The end user, so uh, let's go to an example of a free model. What, give me an example of a free model. Google. Great example, right? So who is the end user on the Google? You are the end user. Are you paying Google? All the advertisers and others are paying Google, right? So the end user, you, you're not the customer of Google. The customer of Google is the advertisers or others there. So that's what that last sentence is. And so if you look at some examples, it was pioneered by search engines, and here comes Google and Facebook and the others. All right, any questions on these so far? All simple, right? Okay, good. We talked a little bit about the newspapers and this gentleman here brought up a question about a marketplace. And so there is yet another model called the marketplace model. And the marketplace model is, it's a model where a company only facilitates the interaction of people on the market. They provide a platform, they provide an avenue. Uh, what's a physical example of a marketplace here? Do IITians go and hang out at Phoenix Mall? You hang out at Phoenix Mall, right? That's a perfect example. You go to the mall, it's a marketplace, it's a venue where people are there. You're not paying anything to the mall. Uh, they're not providing you with anything other than a location where you can go visit the different stores or the different people, right? So they're providing a venue, in this example, a real world venue, 
in the case of uh, digital, can you give me an example for digital marketplace? Amazon, eBay, all good examples, right? So it's the ability, it's the, it, they provide you with a vehicle to interact with others. That's what a marketplace is. Now why is that model an important model? Because it ensures that everything that is transpiring is transpiring around me and I know who is coming and I know who is going. Think about it, if Phoenix Mall, it's a physical mall, if they implemented a system where every person who walks in, they just have them scan uh, the, their card. Now they'll know everyone who's coming in and going out. They know what was purchased. They have created a huge store of value, right? Uh, they can then figure out what stores to attract there. So it, it, it's a platform and the way they make money is by taking a percentage of what is sold or they may charge a fixed rent. So in the case of the advertisement, they charge a fixed rent. They don't say, well, if you're trying to sell your bike, uh, give me a percentage of the price for which you sold the bike. What they'll say is for advertising the bike, I just need, uh, you know, 10 rupees or 20 rupees or whatever it is. So these days nothing can be bought by that. But uh, so here, uh, who pioneered that? Uh, that's that same example, classifieds in newspapers and people who are using it, uh, eBay, Alibaba, Priceline, all these are all great marketplaces. Any questions on this so far? Okay. Uh, the new economy has facilitated some, um, uh, the ability for some new models now. And this is, uh, there's a model called access over ownership model. Anyone want to take a shot at what this means? What about it? What about a car? Yeah, but that's not the access over ownership model. Yeah, you're talking about transferring the ownership. The automobile company is actually selling it to you. They're doing a one-time sale. You might pay it in installments, but they're actually getting all their money from the lending company in one shot. So it's a one-time sale. And the automobile sale model is a very difficult model, which is why most automobile companies are not making a lot of money, which is every year they have to sell a certain number of cars without which they don't have the revenue. Because I sell it once, I get the money. If I don't sell enough cars the next year, I don't have a lot of revenues the next year, right? So it's the hunting model, they have to keep doing it. But that's not what access over ownership is. Anyone else? That, that's right, Net Airbnb, Zoom car, these are classic examples. Now tell me why they work. Why does that work? How many of you really have a need for a car every day? Not one of you, right? You're on campus, you have a bus that takes you from the hostel up here. You don't need a car every day. But how many of you would love it if you had a car maybe on the weekend for three or four hours? You all would, right? And that's exactly what this model tries to fulfill. Going to the car example, I'll give you access to something, but you don't need to own it. All right, so uh, everything is a service. You want a car, that's fine. I'll give it to you for one hour, you pay me for that. Uh, you want a projector, fine. I'll give it to you for one hour, give it back to me. It's a sort of a rental type arrangement. Uh, why is that so important? Because we don't need to be holding all these assets. The customer doesn't need to be holding 
the assets forever. I don't need a car forever. Um, and so I can just use it, access it when I need it. And when I don't need it, I'm done with it. And so we talked about some examples. These were really created due to the new economy, the sharing economy. And uh, some examples are the zip car, you talked about Zoom car here, Airbnb is another example, right? Airbnb, what you will also find as you go through these models and try and dissect what a company does, you'll find that companies have multiple models integrated. Airbnb is also a platform. It's also a marketplace where people can come and uh, find which house they want to go stay in. So it's a marketplace, but it's also a sharing, uh, part of the sharing economy where they give you access over ownership. So it's, a, uh, so it's very difficult to say something is a pure subscription model or a pure marketplace model. And that's the lesson I want you to walk away with today is you don't need to have something that is defined one or the other. At the same time, simpler the model, the more likely it's going to stick. Simpler the model, the more likely it's going to stick. And we're going to see that in the, in the case that we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to give you a clue on where uh, that's going to come up in the case today. It's about Harry's. Okay? So be looking for Harry's in the case today in the afternoon. Yeah, so how is this different than uh, giving something on rental basis? In the purest sense, it's not a whole lot different than giving something on a rental basis. But it, on a rental basis, you have a obligation for a period of time. Right, I'm renting a car for a few days. This tries and cuts it down to a much shorter window. But effectively, it is a way of renting it, and you're just, uh, it's, it's more convenient. You're not into a, any contract, any leasing arrangement, etc. But you're right that it's uh, getting close to that. All right, the next model is Walmart. You guys know of Walmart, right? one of the largest uh, retailers out there and I call it the Walmart market and uh, and I don't think you'll find that name in any textbook that's my name here so the Walmart model is where a company has a massive setup where all sorts of products and services are available under one roof and these these companies act like hyperstores or superstores uh, and they offer a variety of different products at a variety of different prices. And um, the reason that's so important is you walk in somewhere, you have a large choice, large amounts of goods at various different prices. And while this was really created by the likes of Walmart and their predecessors, it has now been taken to the next level in the digital world and there are hyper digital stores out there hyper digital walmarts out there such as such as amazon is a classic example and and the idea of these stores the idea of these stores is it premium or free what is the idea of these stores what's their revenue model here what's their pricing model here Yes, so are they high priced or low priced? Very low priced, right? And all they're focused on is trying to drive the other company out of business, right? Extreme low pricing, forcing others to get out of business. So they have to rely on volume and to generate any quantum of profits. Uh, some examples are, these are pioneered by Walmart. Now, when I give these examples of who pioneered them, I'm not trying to say that these were by name the original pioneers. I'm trying to give you an example of someone you 
uh, know of or have heard of. There were a lot of companies that preceded Walmart that were using this. So I don't want you to walk away saying, oh, that was created by Walmart. It was not. I'm just using a name that you can relate to. Uh, and it was digitized by Amazon. And voila, Amazon is one of them uh, in the examples. All right. Have I confused you guys with the different models? Or it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Okay. Now there is an experience model. What is an experience model? Hotels, okay, they have an experience, oh, but, but tell me more, just saying hotels is not. Customer feedback is needed, that's not quite there yet. It's the unique experience that people are willing to pay for. These are not cheap models, price is not what drives here is the unique experience. You walk into a hotel and someone welcomes you with a garland, right? You go to some of these hotels and they'll give you these Rudrakshamal. You guys know what Rudrakshamal is, right? So you, you, you go there, they put that around you, they'll put kumkum on your head, forehead and they'll do diva, diva around you. And so it's a unique experience and, and people are looking for that. These companies are usually not the lowest priced. Extreme high service. Ha, have you guys heard of Disney World and Disneyland? Magical places, right? You walk into the park and from that moment on everything is perfect. And if it's not, then what? They will make it perfect. Or they'll give you the money back. Or something like that. So they focus on experience. and. It's about a unseen user experience. Uh, and why is that important? Once you go to a place where you've enjoyed that experience, you're not going to go to another place where you're not, you're not getting the same experience, right? So it gets you to stick to it. Uh, the big issue here is if they're not able to keep up with the brand promise, or the promise of that experience, these businesses crater quite quickly, right? So cutting corners and just trying to uh, reduce your cost by a little bit is probably not the right approach if you're going after an experience model. Uh, you could have a made service where you could uh, have two different models, right? One where you're the lowest price, they come in, they do a good job, they do the set amount and they go. Another one is where they come in and they take every good care. They have all these fancy boxes in which they bring things. So two different models. You can't price high experience with low price. And these were pioneered by Apple, right? You get a unique experience with the iPhone. Um, I bought my iPhone, my first iPhone when it came out in 2009, I think. I've never wavered from it, right? It's the experience I enjoy. Uh, Disney World we talked about. Okay, any questions here on the experience model? Uh, depends on your bank, right? There are some banks where they don't care about the experience you get. They're about providing you just a lot of services come in and come out, go out. There may be some banks like Yes Bank, for example, who cater to a higher level of service, for example. And, and so it depends on which bank it is. An industry may have multiple different models. Okay? All right, the next business model is called the pyramid model. What, what do you think that is? Take a guess. What do you think it is? Uh, not quite. It's the other way. Oh, yes, what do you think is a pyramid model? Yeah, it's a pyramid model where one level depends on the next level that depends on the next level that depends on the next level. Now, not, these are not Ponzi schemes. 
You guys know what a Ponzi scheme is, right? I'll take money from you and I'll say I'll return it to you after 10 days. I go spend it on buying a luxury yacht. I've gone and got $10 from him that I then give to you. You think you got your money back. I've spent that on my next car. I get money from him, give that to you. I take that $10 and I go spend it elsewhere, right? That's the Ponzi scheme. These are not Ponzi schemes. These are legitimate businesses and legitimate business models where I come up with an idea or product and I go gather a group of people who are using my product and then I incentivize them to go sell that to others, to recruit other users who would then use the product and also further sell it. You guys understand what I'm saying? Right, I created a product. I don't want to go hire a large sales force. I recruit 20 of you because you think it's a great idea. I say, okay, use my product, but also you need to go sell it. And when you sell that, I'll get 10% of what you sell it for. And when you go sell that to the other one, you'll get a 10% cut or whatever the number is, right? So I don't have to go build my own sales organization. I'm relying on my users to go use it, give me revenues, and build the organization. Are we clear on this pyramid model? Okay. Um, what do you think? Do these companies need a, need a very, very large sales force? But do I need to go hire salespeople, a lot of salespeople? I don't, right? My users become my salespeople. So typically these companies have a very low cost of sales. Um, and here I say that here. They don't have a lot of sales staff. And as a result of that, my certainty of my revenues keeps increasing. Because I know every, so I could say I've got this wonderful toothpaste which is going to make sure your teeth are going to stay till you're 99 years old, right? Now, with that toothpaste, you use it, and you'll continue to use it every, every month, right? So my guarantee of my revenues is almost forever, and I don't need more salespeople. So that's the power of this model. Um, a company that you may heard of is Amway, right? Uh, and they're best known for doing something like this. What do you think here? Does the quality of the products have to be really good or marginal or it could be poor quality in, in the pyramid model? It should be better than other products. It has to be better than other, other products, but I contend it has to be really good because if I'm going to convince 20 of you here to keep using my product, you have to be really convinced with it, right? And then with zeal and fervor, you will go and convince other 20 people to use it. So typically the products have to be very good. Um, and it's the same thing. Amazon has all these other online retailers. Now what you're seeing here is names such as Amazon, Google, Apple, etc., are in different models, right? And as their sophistication grows, different parts of their business use different models. They are not mixing models. Don't misunderstand this. They are not mixing models. Their model for the online retailers is the pyramid model, right? Their model for all of you is the marketplace. Different models for the same company, but for different users. They don't have the same model, two, di uh, two different models for the same person. Very, very important to keep that in mind here. Uh, the on-demand model. What do you think that is? I want something. I want it now. Bring it to me right now. Food service is a great example, right? I want food, bring it. It's on demand. Are you going to care about the price? I'm really hungry. I'm starting from my end, Sam. Get me, get me a pizza, right? And you're not going to worry too much about the price. So speed and convenience are the key factors here. Price is not. So, so a lot of companies make the mistake where they have this on-demand model 
and they try to be the lowest priced. It doesn't make sense to be lowest priced because you're delivering some other value, charge for it, right? So don't mix models is the message I'm trying to give you is you don't need to be lowest price if your value is something else. Um, and again, we talked about this. Uh, I want it. I want it now. Now, the problem with this model is it has to be executed well, right? Let's say uh, everyone's studying for their NSEMs. People are hungry. There's a great pizza place. It's delivering pizza to you and they get so many orders that you're really late. And you're going to say, oh, Kosala usne time pe nahi tha gay time. I'm not going to go with him this time. I'm going to go with someone else, right? So they didn't execute it flawlessly and that model fails. So the key here on on demand is be able to meet the needs of your customer. Delivery 30 minutes are free. Delivery 30 minutes are free, yeah. And so uh, here's a classic example. Uber is a great example uh, of uh, on demand. I want a car, I want Uber service right now. Here it is. All right, ecosystem model. What do you think an ecosystem is? It's where it's a whole family of things, a collection of things. So it's a universe of products. Uh, Apple, I have an iPhone, I have a Mac, I have an uh, Apple Watch, I have all kinds of Apple things, right? It's an ecosystem, I have iTunes. And, and so they have an entire universe of products that fit together, work together. And what, what that allows the company, is, a company to do is to get you hooked on one product and then drag you to use their other products. I bought the iPhone. It works a whole lot better with the MacBook. So I'm going to use the MacBook. Oh, now I got the MacBook. I need to read my books. So I'm going to go buy an iPad and my phone get transferred to my Apple Watch, so I need to buy the Apple Watch. Uh, and, oh, they already have the music store there, so I'm going to go to iTunes and download my music. You see where I'm going with this? Right, so they've got you hooked into multiple different things. And you know what? They've got you so tightly hooked that if you don't like your iPhone and Android comes and Samsung comes up with the new uh, Samsung 9, too bad. You've got all the MacBook and the iPad and Apple Watch. It doesn't work with Samsung, right? You can't escape the ecosystem. They've got you tight. And so now you're an Apple customer for life. Um, so Apple, Google did the same thing, and uh, we have the same names again, right? Let me pause, see if you have any questions on these. All right, so I want to summarize by saying the key takeaways are uh, you should really remember the attributes of the model. Make sure you don't mix models for the same customer. Again, what's in the case study? What am I having you look for? Who? Harry's, okay, you're going to tell me what happened there. Uh, permutations are infinite. The leaders evolve the business models as they go along. And the ecosystem is probably the highest level of refinement of a business model because it's not just one. I cannot escape the Apple ecosystem today, even if I wanted to, as an example. All right, uh, we've talked a lot about examples that are from the tech world and I want to close this portion by sharing with you that these models all apply just as much to non-tech businesses and IKEA how many of you know what IKEA does what do they do
Very good. So they've saved space. They've got the user involved in his product. So it becomes his product. I made that bed, right? Look how what a nice bed it is and it doesn't shake. And I made it myself. They got the user part of it. And they saved a lot of the cost because the user is doing a lot of what really costs money is the hand assembly of the furniture. What a brilliant model, isn't it? And they're not necessarily the cheapest. They're not the most expensive. Good quality furniture, small real estate impact, get you emotionally involved in the product. So it's no longer the IKEA product. It's my table. I built it. I assembled it. Um, and so the experience comes in. So a lot of combination of uh, models here that they're using. Can, you, can someone tell me how many elements to create a business model. You saw it on the slide there? Okay, there's nine different elements, but what are they? Oh, really? It's the business model canvas, isn't it? So, really, there are nine tasks, and you guys have learned this in this session, have you not? Okay, so here's how it all fits together. We talked about some real models, and now here's the business model canvas. I'm just going to rush through it quickly to kind of get you in sync with these models and then we're going to go and do a case study, okay? So um, I don't know how it was taught to you before. Uh, I think of a business model canvas where the most important part is which one? Value proposition. It is the most important part. So unless you have the value proposition, uh, you can't make any progress. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. A value proposition is what is your product, what is your service, how, how is it different from an idea, what are you delivering to the customer, um, you know, what's the minimum feature set, all those things that you learned about, right? Value proposition. The second thing I like to think about is who are the partners that are going to be in my business? Because unless I have people who are going to help me sell, hey, help me deliver, help me create, I'm not going to be successful. So I think of key partners as the second most important part. Uh, who am I going to have an alliance with? Uh, is there a joint venture? Am I going to license anything from someone? All those things I think about as the second step in the biz business model canvas. And then I start thinking about what are the key things I'm going to do, the key activities. And the key activities we, uh, we have here, which is, uh, you know, what do I need to do, basically? Uh, then my customer relationships. So I want to figure out how do I get a customer, how do I keep a customer, and how do I grow my customer wallet share. Three things I want from every customer. I want to get him, keep him or her, and grow him or her. And all the things that go into there, how do I create the demand, how do I keep him satisfied, um, you know, what incentives do I pro provide, all the things that go into my customer. Then I like to look at customers as a heterogeneous uh, world, okay? All customers are not the same. And the more time you spend as you create your businesses understanding the unique customers, the Amazon thing we said, the online retailers was one customer. The people who are buying are different customers. So the better you understand each customer segment, the better you're going to be able to create, deliver, and retain the value from each of those customers. So I like to look at customer segments. Uh, how are they going to pay? What's my revenue model for each of those customer segments? How am I going to reach them, etc. Oh, you guys have know all this, right? I don't need to spend any more time, right? Okay. Uh, the next area is what resources I need what type of people I need, uh, what technology I need, whether I need to manufacture something. All those things are covered in resources. How am I going to sell in the channels? And the next, so all these we talked about creating and delivering value. The last part is about retaining some of that value, a lot of that value. 
Uh, and that has to do with the cost structure and that has to do with the revenue. Right? And the revenue is what do you sell for? We talked about some of the things. How do you price things, etc. So um, what's the revenue model? How does it defer, etc. So we've covered all these things. I'm not going to spend time here. And so the foundation of a successful business is a good business model. It's really not about a business plan because as Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan till you get hit in the mouth. And the minute you get hit in the mouth, which is day one of your business, you're going to forget all about your plan. But if you have a robust business plan, you'll be able to adapt and you'll be able to have a successful business. So I have a question for you. Have you guys seen the Death Valley? You guys all know about the Death Valley. On the left side here, uh, it's the depth of the hole and how much money you lose. This is money and time. And then uh, you've lost a lot of money here. And then you come up and you start making money. And on the right side is the rate of return. You guys know all about this, right? It's been covered. OK, so help me understand which business model is better for a startup trying to minimize the depth of the hole and the width of the hole. So I want you to tell me which business model will minimize both the depth of the hole, how much money you're in, in a loss for, and for how long. Huh? Which one? Remit model. Pyramid model. Uh, no, because the pyramid model takes a long time to build out, right? I've got only 20 customers and then you're going to start using it and you're going to give me one rupee every month or 10 rupees a month. You're going to go get more. It takes a long time to build out. No, no I didn't have a slide by that name, but we talked about it in terms of cars. It's the one-time sale model. It's the one-time model, right? If I have a car and I'm going to sell it to you for 5 lakh rupees, I get the 5 lakh cash flow right away, right? So my funding needs are less and I get positive quickly, right? So I get out of a hole quickly. My hole is not as deep and it's the upfront payment or a one-time sale model that prevents all that. But the downside of that is on a long-term basis, it is, you have to f sell every day. It's a hunting model. You've not built the long tail in it. Remember I said building a long tail is key. You've not built the long tail. So here's the conundrum for an entrepreneur or a startup company. I, I don't have a lot of money to start. I have a great idea. And if I sell with the upfront model or the one-time model, yeah, I, my needs for cash are low. But then it's difficult long-term. So what a lot of companies do is they have a combination here in this case where they start off with some kind of a initial fee or a sign-up fee. Uh, you want to sign up for my service, it's going to cost you a thousand rupees to sign up and then the monthly subscription is X. And so that's kind of a way to balance things where I get some money in, minimize my funding needs, I reduce the depth of the hole, the width of the hole, and yet I'm building a long tail. All right, so we're going to do a case study the next 15 minutes and it's called the Dollar Shave Club. You guys know about the Dollar Shave Club? Okay, mostly I see one, two, three women in the class, right? So bear with me. This is about shaving. So just follow along, okay? Um, so we're going to talk about the Dollar Shave Club. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high-quality razors right to your door. Yeah. A dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. 
I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and ten blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up! Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're gonna stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are dollarshaveclub.com and the party is on. I know karate, I know jiu -jitsu, I drive like a gay, so when I'm coming to see you, see you. All right, so um, I want you to take a couple of minutes and think about what's the business model and what they're trying to do here. And we're going to analyze this case here in a little bit. But I want you to discuss amongst yourself very quickly and, uh, and try and put it in those nine boxes and think about what model they're using. Also, as you're thinking about this, uh, I want you to un know something. This is all real that I'm sharing with you. Uh, he sold the company within five years for over a billion dollars. He sold it to Unilever. And um, the video that you saw there went viral. And it was one of the most uh, often watched videos. And all their videos are similar. So with that, you are to think about what culture they have, what customer experience they're trying to give, deliver, what business model they have. How are they selling? Oh, are they selling through channels, partners, whatever? All right, so before I show you another video related to this, uh, to this case here, uh, most IITians don't shave every day. When I was in IIT, I didn't shave every day, but now that I'm in work life, I have to shave every day. But when you do shave, what is important? You like being cut? Hate it, right? You don't want to be cut. You want a nice, cool shave when you're going on a date. You guys do go on a good date or something? Uh, no, you don't know what that is, right? So you, you want a nice, clean shave, and you know you don't want to be going out there and shopping for a razor every you you right you want it nice clean easy quick so there's an experience you're looking for uh, do, you, do you guys talk about what shaver you used in the morning or what shaver you're going to use on Saturday when you go for a movie no men don't talk about that women you talk about what perfume you're going to wear what clothes you're going to wear yeah but guys don't talk about what shaver they're going to use any any given day that's just not done so um, so think about all those things and now I'm going to share with you another quick video here well you've heard a lot on the news and the radio about uh, Dollar Shave Club Harry's razors and you may have an old trusty Gillette sensor <laughs> that you've used for 20 years since college um, my wife gave me the Dollar Shave Club last year for Christmas, and it's been fantastic. It is an excellent razor. It gives you an extremely close shave, and the blades last a long time. For my beard and face, it lasts a solid week, and it never cuts. It does a great job. I've had the sensor since the late 1980s when I was in college. This is the same original handle. I cleaned it up a little bit because it was disgusting. Um, and these braid blades are great. It's just, uh, I guess it's three blades on these, or maybe two. I don't remember how many exactly are on there. Um, and they're good. They last me about five days, and then they start having a serious chance of nicks and cuts. So that's why I asked for the Dollar Shave Club for my wife. You get these nice four packs that come in the mail once a month, um, and they'll last me a solid four weeks. They're not the cheapest things in the world, though. I think it costs you about nine ninety five a month to keep up the membership at Dollar Shave Club. And that's not with any kind of shaving cream or anything else. So that's not the cheapest thing in the world. My wife gave it to me for Christmas. I felt bad that she's um, having to do it 
you know, basically for the rest of her life. And a friend of mine told me about Harry's razor. He's, um, you know, they're very similar. It's a little bit nicer handle, actually. As you can see, the blades are one, two, three, four, I believe, as well, just like the uh, Dollar Shave for Club. Dollar Shave Club. You get a really nice amount of foaming shaving gel when you get your first kit. And it comes in a really nice kit. Um, but for the price, I think it was a promo code. You know, the, the introduction to this one, I think, was about the same thing. It was like 15. You got four blades, you got the handle, and you got a, a little sample of the shave butter. You didn't even think you could use more than like once or twice. For Harry's, you do get this nice uh, bottle of foaming shave gel, which I think is a big bonus because this stuff is not cheap and it does a really good job. Um, you get a, you get three razors with it, but the thing that attracted me to Harry's was you could buy large quantities of razors in advance. You don't have to just buy, get $9.95 and get four. You, know, you can get a nice eight pack. Um, and I think if you buy them in quantities of 20, it costs you like $25 for 20 razors, which is really cheap. So a friend of mine has two sons in college. They've been buying Harry's the last year because they just buy huge quantities of them. They all share the blades. So I wanted to give it a try. So basically I got a, took out my old Gillette sensor, got a blade, put it in, used it for a week. I only got about five days out of it. When I got to the fifth day, it was getting a little bit difficult to shave with it. It wasn't shaving as close, and I felt like it was about to cut my face, so I kind of got rid of the blade. And that's about normal with my experience. I, I'd try to get a week out of them, but a lot of times I would cut my face on the sixth or seventh day. So then I switched to Dollar Shave Club. This is a this is a fantastic razor. I'd say out of all three of them, this definitely shaves the best and the closest. Um, the first shave, though, I don't know why, when you break a new blade out, it's really rough and <laughs> kind of strange. And I would have, it could turn you off to it because you feel like it's, you're not getting a good shave. But it like breaks the razor in, then your second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth day, you get great shaves out of it. And that was my experience with it in the test as well as, you know, we got a full solid week of shaves, no nicks or cuts, fantastically good shave even on the last day that I used it. Harry's has been very similar. I wouldn't say it's as good as the Dollar Shave Club blades. They're not quite as sharp and the first shave in particular you don't get as good a shave as you get from the Dollar Shave Club. Um, it also seems to kind of break itself in, does a little bit better on the second and third days. Um, and you get a solid week out of their blades too. Maybe not a full week, by the sixth day, I did feel like it tugging and pulling on my face a little bit more than I wanted to. So basically I was getting five out of the Gillette, seven out of the Dollar Shave, and I get about six you know, definite shaves out of Harry's, but for the most part I've been using it for a week. Um, so they're all really good. I think price-wise, though, you can't go wrong with Harry's because you can buy 25 blades for 20 bucks. Um, Dollar Shave Club, I don't know if they have that option. I haven't seen it. You know, My wife got it for me. She kind of controls the account, and it's not really manageable by me. Uh, and if you happen to do like No Shave November or something like that where you don't use the blades regularly for a month or maybe take a vacation and just let it grow, you can get a, they'll start stacking up at your house. I like the option to be able to order them when I need them. You know, I have... 20 on hand now when I burn through that in 20 weeks as I get to the bottom I'll order a new one it Takes about a week to get your razors from any of the clubs um, But I thought Harry's was great for the money and I do like the fact that you can get the shave butter in your initial kit Foaming shave gel I think they call it The shave butter is also really good for Dollar Shave Club, but it's insanely expensive um, It's really up there uh, But it does do it makes your shave even better so any event, they're all great. I mean, I'm so surprised at how well the Gillette sensor is. Where I've had it for 20 years, it's been a fantastic razor. Still does a good job. The blades last five days. If they were, but the blades are not cheap. The blades are expensive, so that's kind of out. Dollar Shave Club is a great option for you, especially if you're trying it out for the first time. But if you burn through blades, you have a really rough face, and you can only get you know three or four days out of a Dollar Shave, you're gonna be better off with Harry's. Um, any event, that's just kind of my review and. Hopefully you will try them out and see what you think. All right, so tell me about Harry's here. W what can you do? With Dollar Shave Club, how many razors do you get every month? Five? Can you get five? No. Can you get two? How many do you get? How many do you get? How many do you get? That's it, right? No variation. You get four blades and you get them every month. Is that the cheapest model? 
Are they the cheapest? He told you. They're not the cheapest, okay? With Harry's, how many blades do you get? Okay, I'm hearing eight, 18. How many blades do you get with Harry's? Eight pack, how many blades do you get with Harry's? You're already confused. He said that sometimes he can get an eight pack, but he could order more a month and he can get 20 of them and then not order more for another month. So you guys already lost the message. How many blades you're getting? You don't know. You think you're getting eight, 18, 20. Now, do you get it every month from Harry's? Do you get it every month from Harry's? Let me back up. Do you get every month from Dollar Shave Club? Do you get it every month from Dollar Shave Club? Is there a month when you don't get it? Do you have a choice? You get it every month. From Harry's, do you have a choice? You do. Sometimes you can get four or eight, or you can buy in 20 and then not buy a month, right? So what Harry's has done here is it has created confusion in your mind and you are not a sticky customer. Think about it. So you order 20 and if you order 20 this month and you need one razor for a week, are you going to order the next month or not? So are you now in that habit of just getting it? Are you just getting the blades? But dollar, dollarshaverclub.com, do you get the blades or do you have to order them every month? You just get it, right? You don't have to do anything. You just get it and you get it and you get it. It's out of mind and it's coming and you're paying. With Harry's, you have to order. So there's an effort that you're going through. And if you forget, you're not stuck to them, right? So what they've done is they've confused business models here. They are both subscription models, right? They're both, are they subscription models or not? $9.95 every month is a subscription model, classic model. Are you stuck with all three of them? Yeah, you are. They're all subscription models. A Gillette is positioning itself as the higher priced one. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, but the point I'm trying to make here is Harry's has now created a confusion where it requires the user to interfere and renew the subscription. Okay, that is a problem. Um, which of those three was he talking about all the time? Okay, so now if you look at the business model canvas, what is the value proposition of Dollar Shave Club? He started his video with that. He's one of the greatest marketers. What did he start his video with? A dollar a shave, right? And a great, our, our blades, are they good? They're not. They're expletive great, right? So great blades. Now he's saying that they are cheaper and you don't need to spend all that money. But this guy just told us that Harry's was cheaper. What's going on with that? Both are true. Mike said, you don't have to spend all that money and all those dollar bills you save, you do whatever you want to do with it, right? So he said he's cheaper. But this guy just told us that Harry's was cheaper. What's going on here? No, but all three are coming home to you. You're not going anywhere. They're all coming home to you. That's exactly right. His message is, my competition is not Harry's. His message is, this expensive Gillette, that's my competition. And you guys think Gillette is a great blade? Yeah, it is. It is a phenomenal blade. But he's saying it's so much more expensive than mine. Right? He's not even talking, and that's a, that's a good way of how you should think about positioning your businesses and your companies, is figure out who the competition is. Right? He didn't need to go after Harry's. So he said, I'm cheaper. 
great. Uh, now this guy said Harry's is cheaper. Now let's watch him a little bit further. So value proposition is what? High quality shave, right? It doesn't cut a nick. Uh, there's another thing which is the Gillette blade lasts only five days. The Dollar Shave Club blade lasts how many days? Seven days exactly. How many days in a week? Precisely seven days. How many days does the Harry's blade last? Six days. All right, so now this guy spent the time to figure out that every Sunday or every Monday, first day of the week, I'm going to put in a new blade. He made my thinking and my calculation so easy, right? Whereas with Gillette, I have to say, okay, I put it on Monday, so now I have to put it on Saturday, which now means next time I have to put it on on Thursday, which means next time I have to put it on Tuesday. Complicated. Same thing with Harry's, right? Six days, okay, so next time Saturday, the week after Friday. Here I don't have to think about it. Seven days, every Monday morning, new blade, good clean shave, right? So value proposition is great shave, convenient, you don't need to worry, you don't need to shop around, right? Hi. Okay, let's watch some more of this here. It was getting a little bit difficult to shave with it. It wasn't shaving as close, and I felt like it was about to cut my face, so I kind of got rid of the blade. And that's about normal with my experience. I, I try to get a week out of them, but a lot of times I would cut my face on the sixth or seventh day. So then I switched to Dollar Shave Club. This is a this is a fantastic razor. I'd say out of all three of them, this definitely shaves the best and the closest. Um, the first shave, though, I don't know why, when you break a new blade out, it's really rough and kind of strange. And I would have, it could turn you off to it because you feel like it's, you're not getting a good shave. It, it like breaks the razor in, then your second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth day, you get great shaves out of it. And that was my experience with it in the test as well as, you know. We so here's a point to note. In any business, in any business, you have to make compromises. Uh, Gillette's manufacturing capability is probably among the best in the world and his manufacturing capability or whatever resources the blades is probably not a whole lot better than Gillette's probably not a whole lot better than Harry's so he chose to make the compromise that on day one it'll be it'll feel a little different it won't cut your face it'll give you the nice smooth shave but it just feels a little different he said it's like feels like it's breaking the blade in but it's a great shave and so that's the way that's the compromise he made to get to seven days whereas Harry's on day one it was all the same but they can't get to seven days so this was a choice you will have to make on where you want to make your compromises we got a full solid week of shaves no nicks or cuts fantastically good shave even on the last day that I used it Harry's has been very similar. I wouldn't say it's as good as the Dollar Shave Club blades. They're not quite as sharp, and the first shave in particular, you don't get as good a shave as you get from the Dollar Shave Club. Um, it also seems to kind of break itself in, does a little bit better on the second and third days, um, and you get a solid week out of their blades too. Maybe not a full week. By the sixth day, I did feel like it tugging and pulling on my face a little bit more than I wanted to. So basically, I was getting five out of the Gillette, seven out of the dollar shave and I get about six you know definite shaves out of Harry's but for the most part I've been using it for a week um, but so they're all really good I think price wise though you can't go wrong with Harry's because you can buy 25 blades for 20 bucks um, dollar shave club I don't know if they have that option I haven't seen it you know my wife got it for me she kind of controls the account and it's not really manageable by me uh, and if you happen to do like no shave November or something like that where you don't use the blades regularly for a month or maybe take a vacation and just let it grow you can get a they'll start stacking up at your house i like the option to be able to order them when i need them you know i have 20 on hand now when i burn through that in 20 weeks as i get to the bottom i'll order a new one it takes about a week to get your razors from any of the clubs um, but i thought harry's was great for the money and i do like the fact that you can get the shave butter in your initial kit foaming shave gel i think they call it the Shea Butter is also really good for Dollar Shave Club, but it's insanely expensive. Um, it's really up there. Uh, but it does do, it makes your shave even better. So, 
any event, they're all great. I mean, I'm so surprised at how well the Gillette sensor is working. I've had it for 20 years. It's been a fantastic razor. Still does a good job. The blades last five days. If they were, but the blades are not cheap. The blades are expensive, so that's kind of out. Dollar Shave Club is a great option for you, especially if you're trying it out for the first time. But if you burn through blades, you have a really rough face, and you can only get you know three or four days out of a Dollar Shave, you're gonna be better off with Harry's. Um, any event, that's just kind of my review, and hopefully you will try them out and see what you think. So we saw some real examples where. Uh, the business models were all was, was confusing in the Harry's piece. The dollar shave value proposition was very clear, and they had a very simple model there. So let me pause and see if you have any questions. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Have a good evening.